What in the world do construction project engineers do? That is the question that we'll be answering in this video to help you know if this is the career for you or to make sure that you're on the right track in your own career in the construction industry. So if you're ready to go, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe and hit the notification bell below so you can join our growing family here on YouTube. And now let's get into it. So if I were to summarize in one sentence what project engineer's sole job is, it's to remove the obstacles so that the project superintendent can progress with the work on schedule and as efficiently as possible. So what does that mean? So let's start with procurement. What is procurement? Procurement is making sure that the materials for the project are on site. So again, big obstacle if the project superintendent can install material because it's not here. If you don't have it here, you are dead in the water. You can't do anything without material. That's why it's so important that as a project engineer that you have procurement down. So how do you do that? So you'll have a procurement log, usually in Excel or whatever program that you have. And that procurement log is tied to every material that you have for the project and that corresponds to whatever it is scheduled on your project schedule. So you take that project schedule date, when is it going to start, and you work your way back to when you're going to get your submittals done. Your submittal is basically your subcontractor or whatever trades version of what the contract documents are. So for example, if you have rebar, the rebar is detailed in the structural drawings, your contract structural drawings, but your rebar subcontractor has to make their own shop drawing and their own submittal in order to show that they have a good interpretation of the contract documents. Each subcontractor uses their submittal or shop drawing to then order and fabricate the material. That's why you look at your construction schedule date and work your way back to your submittals. So you ask your subcontractor, how long is this gonna take to get here? Where is it coming from? What is your fabrication time? What is your delivery time? And then you use all that information to work your way back to make sure that you know exactly when you need to release this material by. And you wanna give yourself a little bit of a buffer. I usually use two weeks in front of the schedule date as your target to try to get that material on site. Some people say like, well, you know, if you bring it too early, then we have no place to store it. You're gonna pay storage fees. Yeah, I, I get it. And as a project manager these days, I would much rather deal with storage fees than deal with me not having the material here. So again, as a project engineer, especially if you're trying to be a top tier project engineer, you want to make sure that you're managing the schedule. You're looking at the look ahead schedules and you're looking at how that relates to your main contract schedule. Make sure those things are aligned. And then you update your procurement log as things change and maybe things accelerate or slow down that you're monitoring that and making sure you're releasing your materials accordingly. And that's why I want to talk about procurement first, because it's so important to just get that material here. And now we'll roll into the next thing for project engineers, RFIs and submittals. So now going back to our definition again, how do you remove obstacles for the superintendents? You see things ahead of time and make sure that they're coordinated so that when everything arrives on site, everything fits, everything works. There's nothing wrong. Cor wrong. There's nothing wrong. So an RFI, what is that? An RFI is a request for information. So that is something where you look at your contract documents. So you look at your project drawings, you're looking at that and you see something that's maybe a little bit off. You ask the question, get it clarified so that when it comes on site, you're ready to go. So an example of an RFI is that say you look at a paint schedule and you're looking at the room finish and you notice that some rooms say one thing, but some rooms say a different thing and they conflict with like your material schedule. Get that sorted out in an RFI to make sure that you don't have a question when the guys arrive on site about what color to paint the wall, whether there's wood base, whether there's vinyl base, that kind of stuff. That's why the better engineer that you are, the better your RFIs will be and the more ahead of the game you'll be with those questions. Because you'll also have RFIs that come up in the field where someone's trying to install something, doesn't work, and what does that mean? The work has stopped, the work cannot progress. That's why those kinds of RFIs are the worst because you're waiting on an answer for you to move forward. You don't wanna be in that situation, that's why your goal is to get ahead of it as much as possible to be the best project engineer. So now going back to submittals. So that's why it is your job to take a look at all these documents that your subcontractors are sending you, make sure that they're submitting it correctly per the spec section of whatever you're looking at, and then just making sure that it matches the other contract drawings. The other layer to this, if you're trying to be like a top tier project engineer, is that you also want to look at constructability. So say for example, going back to rebar, if they're detailing their wall and they're showing like a 40 foot long rebar that they need to install. Like, unless it's specifically required in the documents, you might wanna ask them if that's really what they wanna do. Or maybe they're showing that their core is like three lifts tall and that's gonna be rebar sticking like 30, 40 feet in the air. How are you gonna brace that? How are you gonna deal with that? So you wanna be looking at all of those different types of things, not just matching the contract documents, but can you even build it that way? So again, that's why the 
the better you do it, the submittal process, one, your materials will be correct, and two, they'll come out in a way that can actually be constructed. All of that moves the needle and helps you get things done efficiently in the field. And again, when this is done incorrectly, you stop the work, you stop the progress, and you're not doing your main function as the project engineer. So the third thing that you'll do is field QC or QA checks, right? So QC, quality control, QA, quality assurance. I mean, to me, it's it can be one and the same. Some people make the distinction that QA, you know, especially if you're the general contractor, you're just making sure that the subs are doing their own QC. I get it. I understand that. But ultimately, the general contractor is liable for the job. You want to make sure that you understand all the steps of the process. So what are you going to be doing with field QC? You're going to be actually pulling tape on stuff. Yes, you have to be outside, like measuring stuff, verifying that things work. You're also going to be outside making sure that when the materials come in, that they're correct. You look at the delivery slip. Sometimes they're sending you different job stuff. And then after you did all that good work in the shop drawing verification or getting your RFIs sorted, you wanna make sure that when everything comes on site that they're doing it per their drawings that you reviewed. And then you'll probably be overseeing a lot of the inspections and testings, whether you have your special inspections for structure, for envelope, anything like that. You're gonna be looking at the specifications to see what kind of tests and inspections are required for the project. And you're probably gonna be in charge of making sure those go smoothly, that you have that relationship with the inspector and handling it, making sure these items get to closure in the field. During this time will likely be where you can learn the most about constructability. Take that time to understand what you're looking at. And one of my big things and kind of pet peeves is it forces you to study because how can you do proper quality control in the field? How can you verify anything if you haven't done your homework on what drawings or what is even correct. So it's a good learning experience and it helps you see how things are supposed to come together and what things look like when they don't come together properly in the field. And then the main thing is that you just don't make that same mistake again. The fourth thing that you'll be doing as a construction project engineer is updating your drawings. And I personally feel like nowadays, drawings are always changing. So this is such an important part of the job. And especially if people are just using your online plan system, you wanna make sure that you're getting that updated on a regular basis because the last thing you want is for people to be building off out of date drawings. That's like huge no no. So you usually have some kind of program that you're gonna redline, put the RFI on there if there was another change or anything like that, slip sheeting in the proper drawings, that's gonna be part of your job as well. And that kind of rolls into the next thing about document control, progress photos. So, so progress photos are pretty simple. You can use something like an Insta360 camera, anything like that just to track the progress on the project. A lot of times you'll actually notice later on in your career that if you need a photo for like a litigious reason, like you never have the photo of what you need as like the main subject of your photo. It's like you're taking a picture of this plant, but like behind it, you can see that that wall like wasn't properly waterproofed or something like that. Like that's why taking a lot of photos is so important on the project. And that's typically what you're gonna have to do as a project engineer. And then similar to the red lines, making sure all your documents are in line, your submittals are filed properly, your RFIs are pro filed properly, everything like that. Just making sure that your paperwork is really clean, making sure it's very organized, any logs that you have, stuff like that. Again, it's just part of general organization and the better you can get at that early in your career, the better off you'll be. And now we'll roll into email management. And that's something that I don't think I really foresaw coming into the industry is how much email would be a factor into our day-to-day -day lives. And sometimes, yeah, you just like for me nowadays, like I could easily get 500 emails in a day. Again, how do you sift through that? How do you manage that? So you have to come up with some sort of process, whether it's rules, whether it's certain filings, whether it's just some way where you every at the end of every day, you just make sure that you clear out your inbox. But email management is going to be a big part of what you do as a project engineer, training yourself. And then as you move up in your career, you're going to get more and more emails. So the sooner you can do that, the better for yourself. And the next thing and probably one of the most important things is problem solving. This could be in the field or in the office, but you want to be the tip of the spear as a project engineer because you're the one that is going to start it and usually take it to closure with guidance from your superintendent and your project managers. And if you're shown to be a problem solver, I'm, that's usually the biggest sign that you're gonna be seen in a good light, getting ready for promotions, moving up in the company, things like that. The more problems that you solve, the better base that you have for later on in your career because problems tend to repeat themselves. Because as you move from project to project, you know, you don't bring the same architect firm with you. You don't bring the same engineering team with you. So a lot of things end up getting repeated 
But at least if you've done it before, you've seen it before, you've dealt with it before, you know how to progress later on in your career. But yes, especially if you're one of those engineers that is out in the field all day, problem solving is gonna be such a big part of your job. And it could be as simple as, hey, like there's, a bunch of pedestrians on the outside. How do we make sure that we improve our signage so that we don't have random pedestrians walking into our job site? Or it could be as complicated as a bunch of like weld washes that you need because some anchor bolts are off. But in any event, you're gonna have to train that muscle of just taking the problem, finding the solution, and just trying to be a team player about it. And the next thing that you'll do, and maybe you might not do it on every job, but especially if you're in charge of work that your actual workers are performing, you're gonna have to know how to track costs and quantities. So usually at the project engineer level or the entry level engineer level, all that is is just making sure that you're accurately claiming the amount of quantity that is being done on a daily or weekly basis. So what this does is it tells your project manager is your work or like the man hours and dollars you're spending, is that percentage the same, better than, or worse than your budget? So basically, if you're saying that a, an area is 20% done by quantity, but it's 80% done in terms of dollars and man hours, you're in a bad spot. But as an engineer, that's gonna be possibly one of your jobs. And that's one of the most exciting things I think about the industry is that, well, especially if you're self-performing the work, you have a direct correlation to how the company makes money. And if you're a part of that tracking process, a part of that efficiency process, that really helps you out in your career. And the next thing that you will definitely be doing, and I hope that all of you are just doing it anyway, but sometimes it's easier said than done, but as the engineer, you should be the closest and the expert of your drawings and your specs for your scopes. And sometimes you might be on a job where you are all the scopes, which means even better, you get a lot more chances to learn. But in the structure of the team, the engineers have to be the closest, have to be the deepest in the weeds of what each item is. What are the different spec requirements? What details are on what sheets? Like the more detailed you are and the deeper you are in the weeds, the better engineer you'll be. And as you move up into management, you start to go little by little, more broad and again it's because you know how to get down into the weeds if you've never been down in the weeds to me you don't have that level of knowledge of what things actually look like what does it take to actually coordinate something that's what you do as an engineer again and to me to be a good engineer this is like 101 like if you don't know your drawings and specs and to me the litmus test is that you can rattle off sheet numbers for details by memory. I mean, the, to me, that just means you don't know the job. You don't know your scopes. And to me, that's very important as a project engineer for you to have that skill and have that diligence. And then the last thing, and the most important for sure, you'll be learning. And construction is an experience-based industry. There's nothing that you can learn in construction that comes out of textbook. And you just have to see it. You have to go through it. You have to grind through it. There is no shortcut to the learning. It's just doing. And if you embrace that and you go in every day, hungry to learn, eager to learn, and just knowing that every day you can, you can learn something, you can improve. This industry is made for those kinds of people. So if that's you, you can go as far as you want in this industry. So that's a very general scope of what construction project engineers do. If you have any specific questions about anything I talked about, please comment below and I'll do my best to reply to you. I love the industry and I just wanna help you guys out. So if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe and hit the notification bell below so you can join our growing family here on YouTube. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate your time and I'll see you in the next video.